Bryan Gardens. Grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Jesus, who is here through the power of His Spirit. And it is through the Spirit that we are called into worship this morning. So will you please join me in the call to worship you'll see on the screens and in your bulletins. The Lord be with you. The Word of God is loving and it is active. Amen. As people of God in Jesus Christ, we gather together on Sunday mornings to declare who it is that we worship, to declare who it is that is Lord of our life, and to be strengthened for our lives of discipleship and service and blessing to this world. So my prayer for all of us this morning is that we would meet with Christ through the power of his Holy Spirit this day, that we would be transformed by the power of Christ's word, and that we would be agents of blessing who would leave this service to help transform this world that is hurting, that is broken, and that is desperately in need of Jesus. Welcome. I'm glad that you're here, especially if you are a guest or a visitor with us this morning. I do pray that you would experience Christ's presence. I pray that you would experience a sense of friendship in this community and in this fellowship. Those are all the announcements that I have to share with you all this morning, so I would invite you to stand and to greet one another and welcome each other to worship this day. Let's pray together. Almighty and merciful God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with us as we open your word. Be with us as we hear your word preached, proclaimed. Lord Jesus, be with us and speak to us this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So today is Transfiguration Sunday. It's that Sunday in our church calendar, the liturgical calendar, that falls in between the season that's called Ordinary Time, which always sounds so ordinary and boring, and Lent. So next week begins the first Sunday of Lent. Last week marked, uh, marked kind of our, our, the, first, the last Sunday of the first section of Ordinary Time. So here we are at Transfiguration Sunday. And it's one of the times every, well, every year, it's one of the Sundays every year in which we read the same passage of Scripture from the New Testament. And that's found, we'll read it in just a little bit, in the, from the Gospel of Matthew, where Jesus went up on a mountainside with few of his disciples, and during a time of prayer and of di discipleship and teaching, he's transformed into his glorious heavenly self before their eyes while he's still on earth. And Transfiguration Sunday is for us here in the church a reminder of really two things for us. The first is it's a reminder of Jesus's presence with us in the midst of the trials, the doubt, the hurt, and the struggle of life. See, when the disciples climbed up the mountain with Jesus, they were going through the daily grind. They were doing their life. They had their questions. They had their doubts about who Jesus was. They were experiencing and seeing with their own eyes the brokenness and the suffering of the crowds and the masses who would clamor around Jesus. They would see in the people that they saw in the crowds and even recognized in their own life their own sense of loss and of hurt, their deep, deep heartfelt desire for wholeness. So the disciples were constantly surrounded by that, even with Jesus, even as Jesus was teaching and, with, and was healing in his earthly ministries, the disciples still, the scriptures tell us, had these doubts about who Jesus really was and the ultimate effectiveness of Jesus. The disciples were experiencing deep and great frustration in their own discipleship. And Jesus would bring them to him and he would shape them so that they would then be sent out 
to go do the things that they saw Jesus doing, like healing other people and teaching and preaching and caring for others. And the scriptures tell us that actually while Jesus was with these disciples, the disciples' efforts, their success, so to speak, was marginal at best. And so the disciples were experiencing really frankly everything that we experience in life. And in the midst of that frustration, they got this great and gracious gift of a mountaintop experience with Christ. And we'll read about it in a little bit, but while they're on this mountain, Jesus is transfigured. He's transformed in front of their eyes. And that transports them. It gives them a booster shot, if you will, of the kingdom to come in the middle of this earth and in the middle of this kingdom. A booster shot that reminds them of Jesus' heavenly authority, of his heavenly nature, and of the glory that is coming. And so there in the midst of the struggle, in the midst of the grind, the disciples have this holy mountaintop experience where they have an undeniable experience of Christ's lordship and Christ's grace. But it's fleeting for the disciples in this moment, on this Sunday, as it is at times fleeting for us as disciples of Jesus. Perhaps we can relate to that experience of the disciples. Perhaps we can think about in our life those moments when we've had our own transfiguration type moments where we have in ways that maybe only make sense to us experienced God's presence and seen Christ's glory uniquely and clearly in the midst of struggle we have felt Christ's presence alongside us in the midst of grief we have felt Christ's comfort in the midst of questions and doubt we have felt a certainty in our faith we've had those holy mountaintop experiences when we when we're sitting down to dinner or coffee or drinks with friends and they ask us about our faith, we can look them in the eye and say, with 100% certainty, I have experienced the presence of Christ through the power of His Spirit in my life. But we also know that those moments are fleeting for us. Just like we have those moments where we are sure that we have met with the Lord, we also have moments where we then feel mired in doubt or drift into sorrow and question or wonder when promises that God has seemed to make to us will be fulfilled. And so that's one of the things that on Transfiguration Sunday that we remember as the church. That there are glimpses that we share with Christ and the power of Christ that sustain us through the moments that are more challenging. And the second thing that we do on Transfiguration Sunday is that we remind ourselves of the promises that Christ has made to us. Just like we reflect and we remember and we take heart in the fact that Christ has been, we've experienced Christ's faithfulness in our past, we then also look to the future. And what Transfiguration Sunday does for us, what it reminds us is that one day there is a day coming when Jesus will come again, when Jesus will be glorified, when the kingdom of God will be inaugurated here on earth, and when all will be made well, when all will stand before God and God's judgment in and through Jesus and all will be restored and redeemed in and through Jesus. And so what we are, what we remember on Transfiguration Sunday is the day that Christ will come again. 
And we cast our vision to the future and we hope in that day and we wait for that day and we long for that day. And in that sense, the transfiguration of Jesus that we read about in the scriptures is a foretaste of what is to come. Of what we know will be certain. In our first scripture lesson for this morning from the book of 2 Peter, we're going to be reading an account that was, it's attributed to Peter. It was actually probably written by one of Peter's protégés or disciples. It's written in kind of the ancient Greco-Roman style that's called a testament, which is what's kind of similarly known as... Um, well, for lack of a better word, a deathbed speech where famous orators, famous politicians, famous religious leaders in the Greco-Roman world who knew their time was coming and they had that one last thing that they wanted to say. And so they would kind of prop themselves up, <clears throat> clear their throat, summon all their energy well, it's most likely that Peter actually passes away before he's actually able to pen this testament. But one of his protégés, somebody who was a disciple, made a disciple of Jesus because of the discipleship of Peter, who'd spent his or her life under Peter's teaching and wisdom and tutelage, somebody who was really familiar with Peter's theology, someone who felt so comfortable assuming that name of Peter because they were standing in Peter's apostolic testimony. Right, so one of these disciples in the line of Peter is writing a letter to the first century church, probably somewhere around the year, in between the years of 70 to 90 C.E., and the churches that he's writing to are in the Asia Minor area, modern Turkey, Galatia, some of those churches that even Paul has been in ministry to. And these churches are going through a crisis of faith. 